Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Chang. I'm with Computer Share Governance Services, and I'll be your host for uh, today. Today's session is the third in our joint webinar series with TMF Group on doing business in foreign jurisdictions and the global entity or global risks in entity management. Our discussion today will focus on doing business in Brazil. Uh, for those who missed it, we hosted uh, previous webinars last month on doing business in China and in India, and you can watch recordings of those webinars on the ComputerShare YouTube channel. You're invited to send in your questions throughout today's webinar via the chat feature in WebEx, which you can see in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, we'll aim to keep today's session to about 45 to 50 minutes, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar. Before I introduce our speakers, here's a quick uh, look at some of the items that we'll be uh, covering in today's session. We'll look at the current landscape of Brazil and why it's been so attractive for foreign investment. We'll explore some issues regarding compliance and incorporating a company in the region. We'll also talk about some of the real-world challenges that companies have seen while doing business in India, or sorry, in Brazil. Uh, finally, we'll look at how companies can manage these compliance concerns and to mitigate these risks. So let's begin. Our speakers for today are Joe, uh, Jace Chuni from TMF Group and Joe Delandro from Computer Share Governance Services. Uh, Jace Chuni is currently the Global Business Development Director for TMF Group. He is responsible for all sales development in Brazil as well as cross-border relationships globally. Jay speaks uh, Portuguese, Spanish, English, Dutch, French, and German, which comes in quite handy in his global role. Before TMF, uh, Jace was previously with other multinational companies, including Procter & Gamble, ING, TNT, and L'Oreal. Thanks for joining us today, Jace. You're welcome. It's my pleasure, Peter. Joe Delandro is currently the Director of Sales in North America for Computer Share Governance Services, managing the compliance suite of governance products at CGS, including entity management, SEC filings, and corporate board portals. Over his career, Joe has been involved in governance engagements at hundreds of Fortune 1000 companies. Thanks for being here today, Joe. Thanks, Peter. Happy to be here. So, without further ado, let's talk about doing business in Brazil. Uh, please take it away, Jace. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Brazil, as you all know, everybody has his own vision on, on the country. I would like to share some facts today and, and some more insights on doing business in, in Brazil and some practical uh, knowledge to share with, with all of you. Thank you all for joining, by the way. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you all here. We hope you enjoy the session. Uh, as you know, Brazil is, uh, is in South America. It has about 191 million uh, uh, population, which is a very big one, and all divided uh, all through 26 states. The capital is Brasilia, but all the business is really in Sao Paulo and the, now more and more in, in Rio de Janeiro. It's a federal government with three powers level, uh, which is very important for every company because as a company you have to be compliant with all levels you operate in, meaning if you sell a product all over Brazil, you will have to cross all three, three lines and be compliant with those. Uh, Portuguese is definitely the main language. Nowadays, more and more English is getting more common as the focus not only on the, uh, of the government but also the companies is more on it but it definitely has a still a long way to go before it gets bilingual. Uh, definitely what is interesting here is the, the Catholic population. People are really religious uh, and it combines them uh, across the whole country in that sense. The Brazilian real is the only currency that's allowed by the banks, but it's strongly linked to the U.S. dollar and it will follow also the movement that the dollar makes. Uh, next slide, please. So why Brazil? Brazil is the second largest global destination in terms of the FDI. And that, is, that means that more and more money is coming this this country, and we've seen already 67 billion in 2011, a little decrease in 2012, but still a lot of money. And we actually expect in 2013 to have it increased again because of all the investments for the uh, World Cup and the Olympics. And at the moment, at this moment, actually we have the Confederations Cup uh, going on as well. So what you see uh, is that these investments they they go all over the country and they have uh, been crossing all kinds of industries as well. Next slide, please. So the industries that we, 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 we see the most movements in is, is energy mi mining and infrastructure, also manufacturing and tourism, and, uh, and for a large deal, uh, relatively more progressive than in, in other continents is the green economy, 
which you would expect to be coming here a little bit more later. If you see uh, on the ICT side, there's only uh, already 105 FDI projects going on in Brazil, which is quite a lot, of, a big number for one country. So uh, a lot of has to do with all the pre preparation for the World Cup and the Olympics. But definitely the country is growing as a whole and people are noticing that in every way. The export has also been increasing massively. Um, Brazil has always been known for having a lot of natural resources, which now, in, in, because of all the movements globally, have become more and more interesting for other continents as well. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, the World Cup and Olympics, they're coming. The impact is very, very visible in terms of the business uh, environment here. We see all kinds of industries coming, uh, com companies coming to Brazil, starting from small setups to very large companies like Apple, trying to profit from all of these investments that are going on in the country. And later on, I'll give some examples of uh, one of our clients who have been profiting very directly from this. Next slide, please. I think the most important thing to do business in Brazil is the business culture. It's a very different culture than you would expect and than you would, you would actually be anticipating. A few things that are very important here is, is especially the relationships. The relationships in Brazil are incredibly important. Everything that has been done here in terms of uh, getting a job or getting a business deal done starts with relationships building. The first few meetings with a client most of the time you will talk about soccer, you will talk about their families, about their region. And then in, maybe in the third meeting you can, you can go deeper into what you actually want to talk about, which is the business. But be, be, without a relationship, it's very hard to get to that point. They need to trust you, they need to like you, and it needs to be a partnership from day one. A, a point to, that's connected to that is actually punctuality which for European American standard is very important that there's a meeting, you appreciate the other person's time. In Brazil, it's, it's not uncommon, it's actually pretty accepted that people arrive late at a meeting or even cancel last minute, and it's, it's kind of supposed to be expected. So when you start doing business here in Brazil, keep in mind that it's not personal, that it's not that they don't, they're not interested in, your, in, your, in you as a person or in your company, but it's just a way of, of doing business here in Brazil. What is important, on the other hand, is the long-term commitment. People uh, really like to grow into that relationship they're building with you and see that developing also on the business side. They will also communicate to you in that sense. You, you have a clear view when it's positive and when they're enthusiastic. They will not hide that emotion. Although they can be over-positive and over-promising, meaning that they might say yes while they, they, they might be thinking no. So that's something to keep in, in mind as well. Uh, next slide, please. Setting up a company in Brazil is the first step to, for every company uh, and definitely is something that needs to be thought about before coming here very, very strategically. Uh, the main decision is what kind of company are you going to set up? Is it going to be a Limitada, which is the most widely used, or is it going to be an SA? It, it actually, the most companies that are being set up here are limitadas because of the participation and the commercial activity that, that's involved with that. Uh, to set up a limitada is not very complicated. It takes about 45 days to do so, and it requires a whole number of steps, which I will cover in a minute. But it's definitely something that not, is the, it's not the bottleneck to come to Brazil to set up the limitada. That's something that's not going to be a, a big barrier. Next slide, please. So the steps to set up an entity in Brazil, there's, as you can see, several, several main steps, these seven steps uh, that we won't uh, discuss in detail. But what is more important is that every step is depending on external factors. So even a company like ours who can help you with setting up uh, an entity will still depend on the uh, governmental bodies to give us the feedback and the clearances to go to the next step. And each one of these steps can be delayed. So although the process is normally 45 days. There have been examples where companies had such specific uh, requirements from the government that it took longer at a certain step. But in general, you could say 45 days is the, the process to complete it all. Next slide, please. The second obligation next to setting up an entity is to have legal representation well covered in Brazil. It's, uh, it's obligated here to have at least one person acting as a local director and at the same time also someone who signs 
on behalf of we have the foreign shareholders in front of the Board of Trade and Federal Council. This can be the same person, but because of the, the shift of power to that person, usually nowadays companies stay away from that, uh, that to have employees being one of these shareholders, being one of these local directors, and they want to keep it uh, preferably outsourced to companies like ours who can act in both functions. And at the same time, you see that uh, employees are trying to stay away from being uh, a legal, legal rep for the country anymore because it's very sensitive here in the sense that they are the first one that the government will go after if there is any kind of suspicion in terms of the movements of the company, meaning that they will be the one that will be uh, heard in court, they will be the one that have to show the documents, and until a point that they can even be put in prison or their accounts can be frozen until the government has found out if it's correct or not what they're assuming. So it's a very risky, liable function with a high responsibility, which is uh, more and more something that uh, companies want to outsource instead of keeping internal. At the same time, it's also very important to have people involved uh, as a legal rep who understand what they're signing for, meaning that they have a legal background and they, they know that these documents are compliant with uh, local uh, regulations. So rotation of people, uh, bilinguality, and having a law context are very desirable in this case. Next slide, please. So these are the next three slides are basically all the registrations that you as a company are obligated to do in Brazil. Uh, I will touch upon a few of these. Uh, most important is the, definitely the, the Federal Reserve Revenue. It's the CMP Jota number, which is basically your tax ID number. Everything starts with that. Until that is not registered, you are not even seen as a company yet and are not allowed to even uh, act in the, comp in the country. So that's the first step that needs to be taken care of, and it's always a big relief when we have our clients to that point, because after that it's usually easier to get forward. Next slide, please. One other one which is very important is the uh, Employees Dismissal Fund, number five. The, the labor laws in Brazil are very strict, giving the employees a lot of benefits, a lot of protection, more than, in a, more than an average country, you could say. So that's something to take into, into, into consideration when coming to Brazil and hiring people, that uh, the whole process of hiring and terminating contracts is very strictly regulated, and it's something that needs to be always communicated to the government and to the union. Uh, at the same time, number eight, the Central Bank is probably one of the most um, important registrations because it's such an important uh, asset for you to have that done in, a, in the right way because the moment the Brazilian Central Bank has some kind of a reason to, suspicion, to have suspicion about a transaction. They will just simply block that transaction and all future transactions to a point that they want to release it in the future, if they ever do. So that's something to be very considerate about. Too. The Brazilian Central Bank has a lot of power and controls all the banks as such, and no bank can do anything without permission from the Central Bank, even the opening of the bank account which is uh, definitely something that needs to be approved by the central bank in the end, which can take, normally it takes up to two weeks, but we've had examples of multi-billion dollar companies coming to Brazil, which had to open, had to wait seven months to open their bank account. So be sure that it's done in a correct way and, and that all the paperwork is done, because they have the ability and the possibility to keep asking more and more documents for uh, until an unlimited time. Next slide, please. I think the, the most important one to mention on this slide is the export and import licenses. Those are also very important. Um, to import goods into Brazil is a very uh, strategic decision for companies because there's two ways to do it. One would be to actually hire a company that specializes in importing the goods to have it done uh, by that company and only get the ownership back after the products are physically in the country and part of your limitada. At the second time, the second option would be to actually do it yourself, but to make sure that all the licenses are, are, are clear and all the uh, governmental uh, approvals are done. It's not an easy process. That one can take up to six months to get everything, uh, everything done. So that's something to keep into, in, in mind as well when doing import or export in Brazil. Next slide, please. The time to comply in Brazil, this is actually a slide that's been uh, borrowed from our colleagues from PwC, 
it shows that if you look at Brazil, it's 2,600 hours to keep a company compliant on average in Brazil compared to our, our neighbor, Argentina, which is only 400 hours a year, gives you already a, a, a sense of how much more complicated it is to keep a company compliant and also, therefore, how much more expensive it is to keep a company more ex compliant. It, we have uh, about 115 offices globally and we always get you know, clients from other offices coming to Brazil and they always compare it to, to the country they're from and it's always a, a, sh you know, a shock to them to see how much more the same servers is actually costing in Brazil. And it's not because we are more expensive here, we have the same uh, pricing strategy, but because the country as such is so complicated that it simply takes more time to keep you com uh, compliant. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, about the number of payments in South America. What you see is that countries like Venezuela and, and Bolivia have a whole lot of uh, payments more than, than uh, for instance, Brazil. But this is going to change uh, massively. Uh, Brazil is the largest uh, consumption country in, uh, in South America, and this is going to change. I think next year it's going to be completely different. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the compliance in Brazil is, is one of the most important things for, for a company. It's a, it's a service that uh, we as a company do for all our clients, and basically uh, it consists of the statutory registers and making sure that the Board of Trade and the Federal Council are fully uh, aligned with the activities of the company uh, in Brazil. That is, they really want to know all the details, and it's something that uh, needs to be done very carefully. At the same time, there's additional changes that need to be administrated very carefully, like the dismissal of employees, like the, the, change, uh, the change of the tax IDs, and, uh, of course, the registration for central bank that, that has to be done in a very uh, secure way. Uh, next slide, please. So some uh, practical issues that we have seen and also good things that we've seen with our clients, for instance, here in the last year. Uh, one of uh, the Dutch companies from the land industry, they, they actually won two bids to do the luggage at the key airports in Brazil, in Sao Paulo and in Rio. Uh, the good thing is that the first, the first bid led to the second one because they did it so successfully. But the, the bad thing is to, to really mention that to get the first bid done and to get all the licenses done from the government, who normally has a policy of giving all these bids to local companies, had to create a, a whole new structure to, to, to allow Van der Lande actually to enter in the country with the specific service that they're doing and these machines that they're offering. There was a very lengthy process. It took them about seven months before they actually got any side of green light that they were actually going to be allowed to do the service to the airports. But uh, they almost went to a point that they wanted to pull out, but got, thank God they stayed in, and they not only uh, made a success of the first one and also got the second one. So congratulations to them, of course. Another example would be Osa Spain, who built tunnel for the Brazilian government. Here they had the same issues with the licenses, but at the same time, the, the big breakthrough for them was that they were very uh, capable of demonstrating the Brazilian government what the added value was versus the local providers, because their technology is so much different and so much more advanced than the local ones that the Brazilian government not only gave them the, the bid, but also uh, supported them with many other uh, projects. Another thing that's very interesting to mention is, uh, for instance, Kelp, they won a big contract for, with Telefonica here in, in Latin America, and they are coordinating that all from Brazil. So you see that more and more happening, that companies are using Brazil as the Latin American hub. And that works out pretty well. Even though there's a language difference between Brazil and all the other countries, which is Spanish and Portuguese, it still works out pretty well as, because the business in Brazil is growing so fast that it's worth to start from here and then expand. Uh, another uh, thing that's interesting to mention is that we also see a lot of companies coming to Brazil in a small setup, which means only two, three people to test the market. And that really works out well for them as well because they, they are able to keep the cost low but at the same time, uh, they, can, they can see the market is booming even for their products, no matter what they're selling, and they're expanding very rapidly. An example would be that one of our clients started in January with five people, and now they have 85 people uh, working for them. So that's also very interesting. 
At the same time, there's also companies that are still a bit afraid of entering the market and spending all the money, but they do want to have people on the ground. So a new trend is that to outsource the payroll to companies like ours, uh, to put them on our payroll, and then still have somebody on the ground to actually execute the market. Next slide, please. So basically, uh, looking at all the obligations that I mentioned, uh, to setting up a, a company, having uh, a, somebody act as a legal rep, both for the local director and shareholder signing, to do the accounting, reporting, and specifically the tax compliance, payroll benefits, the obligated statutory registers, and the beginning of all business uh, after the uh, company setup is opening a bank account. These are all services that TMF could provide, help you with in Brazil. And obviously, we are more than interested to, to hear if you come to Brazil, uh, if you could do so. In terms of any questions, feel free to ask them, and we will answer them. Next slide, please. That's great. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jace. Um, those are some really uh, interesting situations. You really do have to uh, factor in the Cousteau uh, Brazil. Um, so now that we've heard about these uh, kinds of challenges, um, let's talk about how the company can address uh, some of these concerns. Uh, Joe? Thanks, Peter, and thank you, Jace. We can certainly see that Brazil presents significant opportunities for growth, um, but not without significant regulation oversight requirements. Um, with all the regulation concerns and challenges, CGS, um, the division that I'm ultimately with, um, feel it's critical that you have a comprehensive governance program and ultimately a system in place. Um, these current systems can, uh, or concerns can be mitigated or eliminated with the, the proper governance processes in place. We'd like to walk through how ComputerShare and TMF can help set up this process together. There are many services out there, but we can combine our services to create a seamless workflow using a, a centralized repository like GEMS. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with um, a global entity management database like GEMS, um, basically GEMS is a, a web-based system that centralizes an extensive amount of subsidiary data um, that can be accessed in real time across the organization, uh, whether it's uh, in different countries or different departments or being utilized by service providers um, such as TMF. So the type of data that's typically managed in a system like GEMS is obviously formation details, bank accounts, um, ownership information, key corporate documents or contracts, um, but more importantly and probably very relevant to this conversation um, is filing and reporting requirements within different countries. Okay. Uh, next slide, Peter. Um, so Jace expressed that local knowledge is obviously key in managing some of the concerns listed here. Um, I'd like to walk through how ComputerShare, TMF, and even your local council can, can combine to create a seamless workflow using a centralized global repository like GEMS. Um, so we certainly are focusing on Brazil at the moment, but of course all of your domestic and international entity data can be maintained in the systems with checks and balances in place. Uh, from formation to maintenance, the actions below can be tracked and ultimately managed um, through the joint service. Where we combine with TMF from a compliance perspective is managing formations, filings, um, and other compliance-related concerns with automation. Um, of course, many of these actions and concerns may require notifications, not just to you, but to others throughout the organization um, in other departments and other um, international locations. So through GEMS, um, it does provide a, a calendaring tool that can proactively send email reminders to keep the organization apprised of when items are due. Um, but in addition, it can also send notifications and send automatic alerts based on different data elements changing in the system. So for example, if a legal entity name changes or if the um, place of formation changes, the system can automatically and proactively send an email alert to say the finance group so they're aware of the changes that are taking place um, from different departments to minimize risk. Um, once a process like the formation of an entity is initiated, um, it can kick off a workflow process um, and ultimately an approval process for individuals that need to be alerted to entity formations and other organizational details to go in and approve that type of information. And we'll go through that scenario um, in, in the, the following slides. So Peter, if you could go to the next one, please. So in, in terms of the approval process, um, once you have local expertise and ultimately the entity information is set up in GEMS, 
you can now have an audible workflow. And an organization like TMS may have the local knowledge and the ability to set up entities for you, but they can certainly be subject to an approval process through a database like GEMS. Um, so in this scenario, which is a critical feature of GEMS, you can see that Adam, um, which could ultimately represent TMS, can create a new entity record in the system. Uh, that the request is then automatically sent to a named approver in, in GEMS, uh, who can then um, ultimately approve or reject a certain change within the system. And that can be by uh, across the entire database or even regionally. So if you did have a approver set up for your Brazilian entity, such as JACE, it can be down to that granule level. Um, obviously, the approver has the option to reject or accept the process, and it keeps an audible trail for future reference. Um, in this case, the approver of the entity, Catherine, may choose to get more information on the entity formation from TMS. Uh, this is absolutely um, key in the process to prove that you followed the right steps with local knowledge and um, getting the proper entity details when managing and relying on this type of data um, for filing requirements. Um, Peter, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, so now once you have the information in GEMS and it's been approved to be accurate, it's key that you manage the ongoing compliance tasks required to keep the entity in good standing. And this is another automated process within GEMS that allows you as the owner of the legal entity to initiate regular data and filing accuracy checks, uh, which is otherwise known as the, the verification process within GEMS. Um, in GEMS, you can have different updaters, approvers, and even verifiers of information. Um, in talking about the importance of having local knowledge in Brazil, your verifier in this country may be someone aside from the database administrator. So it can be potentially um, your service provider being TMS. And ultimately, you need to verify the information is accurate well after the formation to reduce any risks and concerns with annual returns, filings, appointments, any other compliance requirements along the way. So again, this is a process can be managed by your internal company resources or your local experts such as TMS. Um, this whole process, again, is auditable and configurable based on your organizational needs. Okay. Peter, if you could go to the next slide. Okay. And then beyond sort of the ap approval and verification process, there's also what's called a compliance module in GEMS. And basically what that allows you to do is then have a clear method to report this information up and have the ability to take a holistic view of your entity compliance stance across various regions on a global scale. So you can have dashboards without having to data scrub and audit each entity and every entity. You, there's intelligence built into GEMS where you can actually run compliance analysis reports to make sure that entities um, that are set up in the system are in accordance with jurisdictional rules, they're meeting your own internal bylaw or articles of association requirements, uh, but also that the entities have all the key and relevant data that's needed on filings, um, and those filings are can, being completed um, on time. So GEMS allows these compliance checks to be reviewed at the, the jurisdictional or responsible person level to ensure everyone is performing their job effectively. So in essence, the system will flag the entities that are not compliant and then allow the organization to break down into that region and see how many compliant entities there are, how many are non-compliant, and for those non-compliant, how many total violations. So you do have that oversight to ensure ultimately the data you're relying on um, is accurate and you're 100% comfortable in the information. So between the approvals, the, the verifications, and compliance dashboards, um, the system is starting to allow you to implement a governance framework around the entity management process. Okay. Peter, if you could go to the next slide, please. So in terms of the benefits of a compliance dashboard, um, we've touched on a lot of these, but again, it's absolutely critical to emphasize, uh, particularly as more and more regulation comes out, that you have transparency into the entities in a centralized source. So we find that most of the issues that an orga organization has is due to the lack of visibility into what's actually happening in foreign countries like Brazil. Um, when you don't know when individuals are, are being appointed or filings are changing, uh, there's obviously 
concerns that can happen in that process back at headquarters. So by having a combined solution and dashboards to view potential risks, you, you can ensure that you've done what's required by the jurisdiction and by your organization. Again, and that can roll up to the executive level. So dashboards and reports can all be run against that information, giving that greater transparency and ultimate comfort level um, in the data that's being managed locally. Okay, Peter, if you could go to the, the last slide, please. Um, so what other information needs to be shared um, within the organization? So we've been focusing a lot on legal requirements, uh, but it's also key to have other departments involved in uh, managing entity detail and having access to, to key entity information. So you can certainly um, provide information that's not verified and accurate, um, which ultimately is you know, not ensuring a proper governance framework around the entity management process, which is why clients ultimately utilize the tools um, through approvals and verifications to ensure data is accurate and then roll out the system to other departments uh, to manage information outside of just legal data. So for example, um, tax filings, contracts, banking information, um, intellectual property, regula regulatory details. Um, that will provide even more value into a system and the process that you're implementing in terms of um, having service providers help in local jurisdictions um, and utilizing their expertise, letting that roll back to um, an application such as GEMS and putting tools in place to create that transparency and, and data validation. Um, and, but ultimately, getting everybody in the one database centralized um, so that when projects are undertaken such as rationalization projects or certain transactions are happening or uh, even doing due diligence for acquisition purposes. Um, all of the information is in one database um, and not um, spread out throughout different departments where um, information can become out of date. It is in that centralized repository. So ultimately, the confidence that this information is correct allows other key stakeholders to leverage the information streamline your organization um, while reducing risks associated to the global entity management process. Thank you, Joe. Um, now, before we go to the questions, I'd like to remind everyone that we do have another session on Brazil next week if you wish to pass that information on to your colleagues. Um, you can register for that webinar at cgs.computershare.com. So let's go over some of the questions uh, we've received. Um, first question. What is the best process for opening a uh, bank account in Brazil? Jace? Yes, uh, Peter, that's a, that's a good question. As I mentioned, the central bank uh, has a very large influence here in Brazil on, on, uh, on all the movements. They keep track of every movement, and they will not allow the banks to, to, to do anything without the permission. And that goes for the inbound and the outbound flow of money. So to, to, to look into the inbound flow, uh, sending money to Brazil, it's very uh, important to, to register these kind of uh, expenses and capital injections in the right way, because the moment there is something uh, not uh, something is conflicting in those, they will block the payments. At the same time, the the other way around to repatriate money back to the U.S., for instance, is also not that easy. You have, have to have special permission to do so, and at the same time, uh, th there's a few different ways ways to do so. One of them is actually dividend, which is the most widely used. And to choose a bank to, to do all of those transactions for you in the right way is not exactly that easy because it's, a, it's not a straightforward taking your global banking relationship and then going to Brazil. We have seen a lot of American banks, for instance, that have had a lot of trouble getting uh, the compliances and the approvals and openings of the bank account done for their American clients. At the same time, there, there are two banks here, like Itaú and uh, HSBC, who have been advancing in their international payment platform and as well in the, in the way they are able to already keep the local taxes, local tax payments included in the system they use. They are uh, you know, more ahead of that. So be very careful when opening a bank account. It usually takes about three weeks to do so, but it's very important not to look at your, only your global strategic relationship with the bank, but also how it's going to be on a day-to-day -day basis working with a bank in Brazil. That's great. Thank you, Jace. 
Uh, second question. In the uh, GEMS application, um, how easy or can you create a org chart of entities in Brazil? Yep, absolutely. So within the GEMS software, you can manage all of your ownership and generate organizational charts in the system and also export those um, out of the system in the, to various formats. Um, but to answer the question, you can apply filters to those charts as well. So if you want to run it from um, the entire organization, you can, but you can also apply those filters to run it for specific countries, um, such as Brazil, or even by um, different operating divisions. So there's a, a lot of flexibility there. Um, in addition to that, you can also run the charts as of any point in time. That way, if you did have to go back historically to see what the structure in Brazil looked like at the end of the quarter or end of a year for reporting purposes, you can absolutely do so. That's great. I think we have time for two more questions, and probably these are for Jace. Uh, how difficult or easy is it to move money in and out of Brazil? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's what I touched upon a little bit earlier, uh, answering the other question. It's something that you have to keep into mind that uh, in, in other countries where you do business, it's pretty straightforward. You send the money in a certain way, a certain description. In Brazil, it's all about the details. So as soon as the central bank is missing one description or one letter or one number in anything, they will not execute the payment and they will block future payments as well. So the, the best way is to really uh, have uh, you know the local expertise on how to to communicate the accounting records back to the U.S. and uh, also when repatriating the money back to the U.S. So we, one of our key services is that to to help companies get uh, uh, these processes done correctly. And I think it's very important to keep that in mind that it's not as straightforward as you would think. And um, what is the labor market situation at the moment in Brazil? The labor market, that's an area, a very interesting one. If you look at uh, the last few years, a lot has changed here in the sense that uh, it's a, a very good market for the employees. They have a lot of companies coming here that are looking for highly qualified people. And I think it's one of the, one of the few countries where the, the people who are actually educated, almost all of them have a job. It's the people that are not educated that are still unemployed, but there's a, you know, there's a big group of those living outside of the big cities. But in the big cities like Sao Paulo, like in Rio, Brasilia, the labor market is very, very fortunate for the people who are looking for jobs. That's why they're switching quite rapidly uh, between companies nowadays. And at the same time, a lot of uh, international clients of ours coming to Brazil have trouble finding good, qualified, and uh, reliable staff. And then we usually use our own network of business partners to help them because it's uh, sometimes it's very urgent. They're already close to deal, but they don't even have a country manager yet. So it's very, very important to start looking at the right time with the right uh, business partners to make sure you find the right people to, to serve your business needs. And uh, how, is he, how easy is it to get visas approved in Brazil? The visa process can be very lengthy. It's, uh, it's one of the most key important things is to convince the Brazilian government why this person that you're trying to get into the country has an added value over all the other highly qualified people that are already in Brazil. And nowadays there are. There's a lot of people studying abroad, coming back to Brazil. So it, the need for a foreign specialist has decreased. It's, it's usually in the sense of technical areas or engineering areas that is no issue at all and goes very fast. But as soon as it gets more general, like in marketing and sales, you will definitely have to use a business partner that can help you to get the visas approved in the right way because they can actually easily say no and then it, the process stops. So take keep that in mind as well, please. Well, um, I'd mentioned that the top of the uh, webinar that we try to keep it to about 45 to 50 minutes, and I think we're uh, getting close to that right now, so it's probably a good time to wrap things up. Uh, I would really like to thank our speakers, Jace and Joe, for joining us today and sharing their wisdom and insights with us. You're welcome. Thank you, Peter. Like the Doing Business in China and India webinars, uh, today's session will be available on the CGS YouTube channel. Uh, if you have any uh, questions or comments for uh, any of us, our emails are listed here, and you can contact us at any time. Thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Have a good afternoon.